go to the next slide. So again, welcome. Thank you for coming and elevating Texas education with us. We're super excited that you all are here serving as ambassadors for this great work that um, we're kicking off. We're in officially year two of our ambassador work. And so we're excited to uh, kick off this year um, with a fabulous speaker and a really great, um, a, a great group of folks. So turn to the next slide. Um, and so just as a, a reminder, we, our mission here is to address the critical teacher shortage in our state and to strengthen the educational pipeline that connects K-12 and um, in our institutions and universities. Um, and we also are here to support pre-service and in-service teachers by connecting research to practice in accessible and innovative ways, which is one of the reasons why I started saying who's tweeting, who's making infographics, who's thinking about um, how you can make your work more accessible to our super busy educators in the field right now. Um, and we're driven by our, you know, our key drivers of looking, thinking about demographics, data, policy, practice, and partnerships. Next slide. So we want to say thank you. Thank you for your work as ambassadors. Thank you for helping us to share and promote um, research by making it more accessible to K-12 teacher practitioners. Thank you for representing your respective institutions um, and working to curate and create micro content that's going to focus on um, getting your great work into the hands of those who need it most. Um, and then just as a reminder, some micro content includes things like videos, blogs, posts, um, collections of resources, webinars, social media posts. Next slide. So our, pillar, our pillars, um, they help to shape what these meetings look like and our work together um, is amplifying our reach through social media, making that research more accessible um, to support the translation um, to practice. Um, we also use these meetings to help curate our Elevate Texas Education website and help us think about uh, ways that we can highlight each of you as um, faculty members. Um, we um, also use these meetings as an opportunity to communicate and learn from one another and support our collective efficacy around the things that you want to know about. Next slide. Okay, I think that it's my turn. Uh, so hello everyone, uh, I'm Weston Rose um, and I uh, support uh, Dr. Krafka and Dr. Prescott uh, on the Elevate Tech Ed Ambassador Network. Um, so we know that this is an important community of practice, but we also wanted to highlight some of the incentives that there are um, for you to be an ambassador. So upon successful fulfillment of all these expectations, uh, ambassadors like yourself will receive a signed letter of recognition from the UT system uh, featuring uh, Chancellor uh, J.B. Milliken and also the Executive Vice Chancellor Archie Holmes. And this um, could be something that you could add to your tenure uh, file, tenure and promotion. Um, uh, and it's just going to talk about everything that you did and how you've been helping our collective system-wide efforts. Um, also, uh, you'll have the opportunity to be showcased uh, at a monthly uh, UT System College or Program of Education Dean's meeting. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, you'll have the opportunity to have your research uh, showcased on our Elevate Text Ed uh, website as um, a few of you already have. Um, and then we wanted to just talk about a little bit uh, in terms of the expectations of ambassadors. Uh, nothing too strenuous, but um, we uh, would hope that an ambassador would attend at least six remote ambassador workshops, which most of you already do, uh, over the course of the 2021-2022 academic year. Um, also share at least three deliverables. That could be anything from a blog or a podcast that you've created, um, a video lecture, lesson plan, infographic, uh, any of that micro content, and you would share that via social media. Um, so Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, whichever platform you feel most comfortable with um, over the course, again, of the 2021-2022 academic year. And finally, collaboratively share and create resources that make research and scholarly knowledge more accessible to public educators. Um, and down here, we'll make sure that you have this, but we have a um, link to the commitment agreement. And uh, another thing we wanted to highlight were just recommendations. This group 
uh, is made up of a lot of important people. But if you know of a colleague that you think would be perfect for this work, um, you know, we'd love to have them join, the more the merrier. So um, if you do, please send any recommendations either to Dr. Krafka, uh, her email address is right here, uh, or myself, and uh, we'd be happy to take those recommendations and invite those uh, folks to this meeting. All right. And now we'll move into the next section. Thanks, Weston. Um, so I just wanna say a, a, a big thank you and uh, to uh, Dr. McCarthy for joining us today. Dr. McCarthy will be sharing some of the work he's been doing at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, so I first reached out to Dr. McCarthy because of some work that we were doing in a program called Texas Education Start. Our teachers were, uh, we support early career teachers in Austin ISD and our teachers were just crumbling, falling apart really like just super stressed out. Lots and lots of our teachers were talking about um, quitting. They didn't want to continue the work. Uh, and these are you know, our earliest career teachers that we were hoping would be excited and you know, innovative, uh, like uh, feel invigorated about the work. And instead they you know, walked into a pretty, um, a pretty high stakes and very upsetting situation. Lots and lots of um, you know, things flying their way, obstacles and barriers and things that were making their job really challenging, um, including COVID. So um, we reached out to Dr. McCarthy and I had the opportunity to get to know a little bit about um, him and the work that he does. And so I'd like to welcome him, to him today. Dr. McCarthy works in the Department of Educational Psychology. He's a lead authority on stress and coping, does a lot of, of great research in this area. And he'll talk a little bit today about um, his research and then what he does to help get that research into the hands of district leaders and teachers to help better support them. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. McCarthy and thank you very much for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction. It's good to uh, talk to y'all today. Can everybody hear me okay? Can I get like a, okay. I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding. So that's, that's really good. Um, yeah. So it's, um, uh, as I'm talking, of course, a garbage truck is going past my street here. So you may hear a little background noise. Um, but yeah, so I'm a, a person in um, the educational psychology department, but I, and even though I'm a psychologist, it's kind of unusual to study teachers because counselors and psychologists usually study therapy and um, psychological processes like that. But I've always been interested in stress, um, particularly. And then around 20 years ago, I started working with a colleague at UNC Charlotte to really focus in on um, teacher stress. Um, and at that time, I think the, you know, 20 years ago, most of the focus was on the accountability movement, you know, it was around the year 2000. So George W. Bush was just starting as president and um, there was the whole accountability movement. Um, I'm not sure that's the right word to use, but I'll, that's kind of what we called it, at least then. And so the folks of the focus was on the students, of course, um, and achievement and um, things like that. But we just became really interested in what effect is this having on teachers? Because in our view, it really seemed like accountability movement for teachers. Well, what does that imply exactly? Because we don't have an accountability movement for dentists, right? I mean, when you get a cavity, that's your fault. Um, the dentist is just there to patch it up. But somehow for teachers, it's one of those professions that gets politicized. I hope I'm not saying anything controversial to this group, but I think it's pretty clear that they become kind of a pinball for um, whatever's going on in society. So we became just really interested in understanding teacher stress. And at the time it was really recognized that yeah, it's stressful, but there really wasn't a lot of work examining, well, how stressful is it? And for whom is it stressful? And if it and for those people for whom it's stressful, what impact does it have on them? So our research started um, really trying to assess teacher stress. Um, and we came from a framework that really emphasizes stress is it's a psychological process and it's really has to do with like our own um, psychological balancing of demands in our environment and what resources we have so the demands are like anything that's um, like a requirement or something that you have to do or some kind of challenge 
And then resources are, um, you know, things you have to cope with stress. So it could be psychological, it could be um, relationships, it could be material things like financial resources. Um, so we were really interested in, and so this notion of stress really came from psychologically, it's, it's kind of a balancing act, well, much like your checkbook, right? If you, if you have too many things uh, going out of your checkbook, I know we don't use checkbooks anymore, but metaphorically, um, if you have too many things drawing on your checkbook and not enough going in, like then you end up in trouble pretty quickly. So we developed kind of with that thinking in mind, a measure we called the classroom appraisal of resources and demands for teachers. We call it the card for short. And it was basically a list of questions for teachers about how demanding do they find different things in their classroom. And we really focused in on their classroom. So we were focused on classroom teachers and what makes their particular classroom stressful or can make it stressful. And so we have a, a bunch of questions that ask them about their classroom, like demands related to students, demands related to pedagogy, demands related to administrators, and then what resources do they have? You know, like instructional resources, peer mentors, um, professionals in the school, those kinds of things. Um, and so that really kind of launched us on a whole series of studies that kind of take us up even to this, the research I'm gonna talk about now where we really use that lens of teacher's stress and really trying to identify which ones are most vulnerable to stress and how does that impact their occupational health. Um, so I think I can move to the next slide. And Christine, help me on time because I can talk. So when I get started on this stuff, I can start talking. So. That's totally <laughs> fine. You're good. <laughs> Um, and so what our research, my research, I mean, I work with a bunch of graduate students and colleagues from other places, um, particularly UNC Charlotte. There's a couple of people I work with closely there who are also in education. Um, and we've kind of had two, two branches of research. We try and understand what's the impact of stress on teachers. And we use a lot of, um, uh, and I'm happy to share this infographic afterwards, or Christine can share it. Um, but we tend to have used like large surveys of the teacher workforce to really document the effect of stress on teachers. And so there's a bunch of surveys that the National Center for Educational Statistics uses nationally. Um, it's called the Schools and Staffing Survey. And they had very similar items to us about like demands and resources for teachers. But using those large data sets, we were able to look at like national trends and which teachers were reporting the most risk for stress and then how did it affect their occupational health? And because these items were all in these large national surveys and they're given every couple of years. So we were able to show um, pretty clearly with those national data sets um, that when the teachers are vulnerable to stress and it can be in the same building, you can have teachers who are highly vulnerable to stress and not at all. So when we say teaching is stressful, it's you know, and I think this is important for the work that you all do, it's not every teacher is affected by stress in the same way. So it's really important to understand which are the most vulnerable and certainly like new teachers, that's a particularly challenging time. So we were able to doc document a number of um, connections between the teachers who are vulnerable to stress and things that probably won't surprise you like burnout, job dissatisfaction, start to thinking about leaving the field, all of those things that are always go along with stress. Um, and in one of the really interesting uh, surveys we did, there's a survey that was given out nationally in 2007 called the Beginning Teacher Longitudinal Survey. And we were able to look at which teachers who began their careers then, we were able to track them over the next five years. And it was really interesting that um, you could see a real clear pattern with teachers who started their first year of teaching, really demanding situations, they were very likely to think about leaving their campus the next year. So they were like, they didn't leave the field, but they were much, like twice as likely to like leave their campus. And we kind of think that's mainly, you know, you're trying to find a better situation. Um, but then if you look like four years out, those teachers were twice, like the ones who had really high demands in their first year were twice as likely to have left the profession after their fifth year. Um, so we found that like really compelling data um, and we, we wanted to then move into like, what can we do about it? And so one of the things I study in addition to teacher stress is group dynamics. So group counseling, group interventions. And so we created a, um, another arm of our research, which focused on like, how can we use small groups for teachers in the classroom 
to like teach them about stress, give them a place to connect um, and really kind of um, give them some tools, but also create a space for them to share. And so that, I'm not gonna talk about that in any detail, but that's research we've done the last couple of years. And we've moved it also with pre-service teachers because we found a lot of times you do the group with teachers who are like well along in their profession, they're already kind of burned out, <laughs> sad to say. Um, and we wanted to kind of give these tools early on. So we, one of my students did his dissertation with pre-service teachers at UT um, that was really well received, kind of teaching them principles of self-care and, and things like that. Um, so the infographic that uh, is up here is a study we did last year in collaboration with Round Rock schools. So we had formed a partnership with them over the last couple of years um, to work with the district on, um, you know, the stress of their teachers. But before the pandemic started, they have a climate survey that they did every year and they agreed to include our items from the card in some of their teacher climate surveys. And so we were already like kind of involved with research um, and we had really interesting findings from that climate survey. That was in January of um, 2020, right before the world ended. <laughs> but um, so we had like this really interesting data that we've been using as well that I, I won't get into, but as you can see, I can really start talking when I get started here. Um, really just kind of looking at campus by campus, um, you know, which campuses were reporting the highest levels of stress, what other factors seem to go along with that, like turnover in administrative leadership and, um, you know, where the school was situated, um, those kinds of things. Um, so we'd begun that work and that's when COVID hit um, in the spring, obviously, of 2020. So this um, infographic is a collaboration we did with Round Rock last year um, to really try and use what we'd already been doing to understand how teachers were doing during the pandemic. Um, obviously, mostly not, not well, as we all know. Um, so we did like a, a monthly survey with the teachers. We partnered with the district to give them some incentives to, you know, each month fill out a little checklist about their stress. Um, so, and that went out through a, a Qualtrics link. So um, they just got a little link about like, what are their, a very brief version of our measures saying, what are the main demands? What are the main resources? Um, what kind of instructional format you're using now, you know, whether you're hybrid or online. Um, and those went out every month from December through April. Um, and that's kind of like the way we, and really, I mean, looking back on it, we didn't know what to expect. I mean, who knew what, you know, we were planning the study last fall. We were like, who knows what's gonna happen with COVID? I mean, it could go away, it could get much worse. I mean, you know, so we were really interested in like, what was happening on a monthly basis. Um, and so this is just a real brief snapshot. So we, in addition to asking them survey items, we also asked them really open-ended questions, you know, kind of tell us in your own words, what's going on, um, how are things going? And so that's that little red box at the bottom. Can everybody see that okay? Um, and yeah, so this is- We also put the link in the- um... Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. And really this infographic, kind of what Christine was talking about, was really what we created to give back to the district and to give to stakeholders in the district because we've been presenting this research at conferences and, and things like that. Um, I'm actually right now working on an edited book on teacher stress during the pandemic. And we've got a lot of contributors from across the US and across the, the uh, world, really. We have you know, people from different countries, but we were like, let's create something that we can share with people and, and kind of create a discussion because most of the stuff academics put out, like me, is kind of dense sometimes and you know, not accessible to a lot of people. Um, so we did the surveys. And so I'll, I'll talk at the bottom that red part just is, is qualitatively like in their responses. So we used a team of graduate students to kind of analyze all of the things they said each month and what kinds of themes and patterns did you find? And I had to say, one of the things that was really interesting was it was really consistent each month. You know, we thought, well, maybe it'll be all over the place. One month the teachers will be talking about X, the next month Y, but actually, you know, it was really kind of the same things affecting teachers each month. So it, everything we did kind of pointed at 
different aspects of the same issue, which is just the high demand levels, the uncertainty, all of that kind of stuff. Um, as you may not be surprised, what really came out in our data was um, the hybrid instruction being very demanding last year for teachers. You know, so as the year unfolded and as the pandemic unfolded, the ones that were asked to do both were really just, you know, they just were on and on about how just challenging that was. Um, the other piece that came up a lot <coughs> was just the communication from administration. So, you know, they appreciated that um, when it was like really timely and consistent and was helpful. But I think one of the things that happened a lot in higher ed and K through 12 was people responded by sending all this information out, you know, and it was often just another thing that teachers were confused about, particularly as, you know, all of this was unfolding is, um, you know, it's just too much. I can't keep up. Um, and I really found that here as a faculty member at UT, like last year, we get all the well-meaning emails, here's some support and some resources and some links here, click here, click here, here's some data. And it was just enough. Like I was just trying to get through the day and um, I could use a few timely things, but I didn't need like all of that information. Um, and then the last bullet point there is um, just qualitatively. And this was the part that really, really comes through when you're doing open-ended questions and letting them speak in their own voice was just the heartbreaking experience of the impacts on their own mental health, you know, because they're on the front lines, they're trying to take care of their students, they're trying to take care of themselves, a lot of them have kids at home, and they're just, you know, just trying to put their finger in the, so many holes in the dam all at once. Um, but just a lot of them talked about the negative mental health impacts, um, you know, the isolation, and just the, the fear of what was going to happen, you know, as the year unfolded. So is that our, I think we should probably go ahead and move to the next. How am I doing on time, Christine? <laughs> yeah, we have, um, you have five more minutes. All right, great. Yeah, if you'd like, or I can, I can take it. It's up to you. <laughs> um, no, I can, I can start. I kind of gave you the background, so I think I can move a little quicker now. Yeah. Um, that top left slide is um, what we got quantitatively. So we used our, our card measure our assessment of which teachers had the highest demands compared to their resources. And that chart really kind of shows in the green is where the high resource teachers, those that were coping pretty well, where they really were saying that where they had higher scores. So preventive coping is really their own psychological resources. They reported those were higher, um, which makes sense. You know, they were the ones less vulnerable to stress. They talked about more positive emotions. And then we really looked at their efficacy as a teacher. So as far as student engagement, all of those things were higher. So those are like really consistent. And again, for those of you reaching out to teachers and really trying to support them, I think this just underscores the connection between their own well-being and stress and how they do in the classroom. The teachers who were feeling like the stress was under control were reporting all these green lights across the board. And then the ones, the teachers that were more in the high stress category talked a lot about just they had really higher high levels of perceived stress and then a lot more of the negative emotions. Um, and then those two boxes uh, on the left, um, we did some follow ups with and these were um, students of mine who were doing dissertations. One was on gratitude. So she was really interested in that as an intervention for teachers. We see that as like a something you can do system-wide for teachers that is um, you know, relatively low cost. Um, there's not a ton of research on it now, um, but she interviewed, she, didn't, she wasn't able to provide gratitude, but she was able to interview them, you know, what's helpful about it. And the teachers really um, reported how much experiencing gratitude impact their efficacy as a teacher, but that was most helpful in their comments was when it's really targeted to specific things they were doing. So they really appreciated the gratitude, but things like Teacher Appreciation Week weren't as well received because they were generic and it didn't feel like it valued their particular work. Um, and they also, when they were talking to us, worried about, well, yes, I like gratitude, but I don't want it to substitute for money. <laughs> so that's, I think, one of the things with the helping professions or, you know, is like sometimes we get thanked, but <laughs> it feels like we're not going to get compensated either. Um, and then the last, another follow-up we did was around mentorship, which I think is connected very closely to the work you all do. 
um, which is like what aspects of mentorship were helpful. So um, a lot of it that was most helpful was informal. Um, they talked a lot about structural barriers to actually getting the mentor they needed. So release time and their schedules or opportunities to connect with their mentors. Um, and it really, but when it worked, you know, when it clicked, it was a very positive um, source of support for teachers. So both of these were highlighting things we can do to support teachers that are pretty actionable if they're done well. Um, so just to kind of wrap up from our survey, it had a couple of these different branches, but obviously it impacted teachers' occupational health very strongly. Um, and then there are these things we can do, perhaps looking forward to think about ways we can better support teachers in the future as we hopefully move out of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McCarthy. I appreciate you sharing. <clears throat> and um, our, our journey with uh, Texas Education Start um, has been uh, really interesting because we've had opportunity to create an early career support program for teachers in Austin ISD, um, working very closely with the district. Um, we work with 14 campuses. We have seven teacher leaders, and um, we also work with faculty experts who can come in and help to provide support to these teachers. And so I'm gonna share with you a little bit about our program, what we've done to help bring this program to life, to help tell the story of the program through, um, through uh, the use of social media and through the use of um, creating little videos and, um, um, and then, all, and then um, sorry, I've like totally lost my train of thought for a second. Um, and then also, yeah, I'm like, uh, what would I say? Um, infographics, using infographics, using data, and then also using uh, some of the work that Dr. McCarthy um, did for us. And so I will start our story um, in this space. Will you go to the next slide, Weston? Thank you. So our novice teachers receive coaching and mentoring from teacher leaders um, that are hired as external consultants, um, the best way I can explain it, hired as external consultants. We um, use our teacher leaders and also work with the district to provide professional development and uh, learning opportunities for uh, these novice teachers. In addition, our faculty experts uh, create resources for professional learning as well. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of is that we um, also create opportunities for our teachers, our early career teachers to um, um, be part of a near a, a peer network. So working with these teachers to give them some additional support so that when we go away one day, they still have one another to lean on. Um, and then we also have classroom ready resources. So things that they can put to, into use um, immediately. And we provide those through a virtual platform so they can go online, they can print resources. Um, and then in many cases, they'll reach out to their teacher leaders or their coaches and mentors and say, hey, this is what I need. And those folks will bring it right to the campus for them. Next slide. So um, our teacher leaders, here's our, a, a picture of our teacher leaders and they serve um, as the bridge really between theory and practice. They um, make, we work really hard to make strong connections between what an early career teacher learned in their pre-service program and um, they help them to put that into practice so they can see it come to life. Um, next slide. So this is um, one of our teacher leaders talking a little bit about the program along with one of her students that, or one of her early career teachers that she works with. Let me press play on that. Hi, my name is Shannon Galvan and I'm the teacher leader for Walnut Elementary School. Through the Texas Education Start program, we had the opportunity to support teachers as they navigate this difficult time. Hi, my name is Destiny Nichols. I teach first grade ESL at Cook Elementary. Um, I am also the first grade team lead for this school year. It is actually my third year of teaching, all of which have been at Cook. I've always known that I wanted to be a teacher, so I really am living my dream right now. I've gotten the chance to work closely with Ms. Nichols in her classroom. We sit and reflect together. Gives our students together. 
you know, like stated together, I met Shannon Galvan last year, um, the crazy COVID school year, and got to, you know, work with her a little bit, but this year we really jumped in and started working together. She's helped me with stations, groups, small groups. She's helped me with some classroom management. I'm already seeing a lot of improvement because of the help that Shannon has given me. Had the chance to really look at her classroom scenes and make sure all students are successful. She's also helped me with some outside of school type work because I am in grad school. So she's been a great help and a great support and mentor for even my grad school assignments. Coaching is more important now than ever. Being a novice teacher and teaching college in that, but many of the novice teachers were unable to complete their traditional extensive in classroom training program. As a teacher leader, I'm able to come in and support them however they need, whether it's observing, reflecting, helping provide instructional support. Together, we're able to navigate these crazy years and make sure they feel successful. So I'm super grateful to be working with her. So thank you, Weston. Um, so the internet was a little hard for me. I don't know if it was the, uh, that way for everybody, but um, I did put the link in the um, chat if you'd like to take a look at the video um, using, um, you know, on in your own time. But um, at any rate, I was going to share. Um, this was something that we put together. It was super, super, super simple. We wanted. Um, to be able to tell the story about our program with using the faces and the names and hearing from the teachers and our teacher leaders. And so um, Shannon and her teacher, this was both video, they just recorded themselves on their iPhones. Um, and then they sent that, that video over, their videos from their iPhones over to Audrey, who then um, was able to put that together and put some music behind it. So um, if you have an amazing graduate student like I do, um, you can solicit their help to be able to put things like this together and you'll see some more evidence of Audrey's work as we continue um, on. But I loved how this came together because it's a great way to see the program come to life, but it was done so simply, really just reaching out to Shannon and saying, hey, can you and a teacher, one of your teachers, you know, send us a little blip about um, why what you're doing is important. So another way to um, share the work that you're doing in super easy ways. And we put that up on YouTube. We asked our College of Ed to um, tweet it out. And so um, they did that. And last time we did it, I think we had, I don't remember how many views, but it was a lot. One of my teacher leaders reached out and said, you didn't tell me people were gonna actually be watching the video. <laughs> I was like, sorry. All right, so um, that's all for our Texas Education Start and how we got the word out about what we were doing. Weston, if you'll click to the next slide. And so these videos, making these little short informational videos also have helped us and will continue to help us um, reach out to faculty members so that we can um, get experts like Dr. McCarthy to come into the program and um, use them to help support our teachers. And so here's the teacher or the faculty experts that um, we work with currently. Um, and we work with them each in very different ways. So with Dr. McCarthy, um, we've, we've created some additional resources that I can, uh, that Audrey is gonna talk us through in just a second. Um, We've recently done some work with Dr. Brown and we're um, curating that to make sure we have that out in front of our um, teachers as well. Dr. Tost comes and she's uh, a faculty expert. Her specialization is special education. And so she does one-on-one um, -on -one consulting with our early career teachers as well as um, works with them in groups or in small cohorts. Um, and so, all to say we have these faculty experts that work very closely with our early career teachers or provide resources and support to them. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Audrey and you can move to the next slide, oh, Weston. So Audrey can tell you a little bit about um, how we began working with Dr. McCarthy specifically to help create um, a resource for our teacher leaders based on an interview that we conducted with him. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, so the first step in this process was um, to kind of think and empathize with our 
novice and early career teachers. We knew that they were stressed and they were expressing this to us um, through their relationships with their teacher leaders. Um, and so when we were able to connect with Dr. McCarthy, we came up with a list of questions um, from the perspective of if one of our early career teachers got to sit down with Dr. McCarthy and just ask him about his research, um, starting from, you know, simple question like, how would you define stress? Um, because a lot of these terms are things that maybe at the higher ed level we talk about not knowing that they're more technical for educators out in the field. So we came up with a list, we went back and forth and kind of refined um, that list. And then we set up a day to Zoom. And essentially I just turned off my camera and muted myself in between questions and just asked these questions to Dr. McCarthy. Um, and recorded his responses. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so after we recorded the Zoom, I took the recording and um, edited out my parts where you can hear me talking and asking the questions uh, to where it was just Dr. McCarthy, added in graphics that illustrated what he was talking about or you know had words around him. Uh, that coincided with definitions that he was using. Um, again, to make this a more accessible resource for someone that knows nothing about these topics and is watching it. And this is the screenshot of um, our thumbnail for our YouTube video. And then, can you go to the next slide, Weston? So after we edited this video and went back and forth about it, it ended up being about 20 minutes long, which in the grand scheme of academia, it doesn't seem that long, but uh, when you're a classroom teacher, especially this past few years, it's hard to find a 20 minute dedicated time to sit down and watch something, especially if it's in kind of a lecture heavy informational um, context. So one of the things we decided to do is we wanted to not only break this up into bite sized pieces, but we wanted this to um, be something that teachers could talk about together with their teacher leader to kind of make sense of all this information and connect it to their own lived experiences. Um, so Weston, if you'll click on that uh, self-care for teachers, this is the page that we put together um, that kind of acts as like an instructional blueprint or lesson plan, so to speak, uh, that our uh, teacher leaders use with their groups of novices um, when they're going through this. So it can be something like they're only showing a part one clip um, and asking and discussing these questions. And that might just take up 30 minutes. And then the next time they meet, they'll talk about the next part. Uh, so we divided this video into, I believe, four sections. Um, and Weston, if you will press play, you'll see that this chunk is only six minutes. Um, and then Weston, if you will fast forward to like maybe six minutes and four seconds, right near the end. Okay, six minutes. And then press play just about the very end. So you can see the graphics that I added and the words that coincide with what he's saying. Um, and I see the question in the chat. I used, I used Adobe Premiere when I am editing uh, videos. So if it loads, which it may not, but um, at the very end, um, there are questions that pop up. And we also included these questions on the left side of the screen. So if you look next to Dr. McCarthy, these are the questions that we encourage our community um, of novice teachers to discuss um, after they watch this video with their teacher leaders and the other novice teachers, again, to connect what they're hearing and learning with their personal experience and make sense of it in groups. And then of um, course, Texas, not only are they dealing with- if you will awesome. pause that and scroll down, um, scroll down to part three. All right, so uh, part of this process is not only watching these videos and talking about it as a group, um, but we came up with an activity that is using Padlet um, for the teacher leaders to with their novice teachers uh, do what Dr. McCarthy suggested and, and take an inventory of what are all the things that are on my plate as a novice teacher right now? What are all my stressors? And then once I have all those written out, what are the resources that I need in order to meet these stressors? 
And having this conversation as a group, hopefully, um, will you know illuminate the the types of resources that t teachers have access to that maybe they don't know that they do, or you know inform the teacher leader what kinds of things that they can provide to the nonce teachers. Additionally, on a program level, we can look at these and we can see patterns. We can use this for research. Uh, because we have a definitive list of all of these different types of stressors as they make sense to um, our novice teachers in our program. So um, the, the software that I use to um, cut up those videos further is something that's free. And as professors, um, I highly recommend using it. It's called Edpuzzle, and I'll put this in the chat. Um, but if you have never heard of Edpuzzle, Essentially, it takes any YouTube video um, and you can, as a teacher, cut it up, but you can also insert questions throughout the video. So you can actually put multiple choice questions throughout the video or open ended questions or um, even just an announcement um, or your commentary through a video. And then as a student watches it, um, they actually you know, get a grade and as the professor, you can see how all of your students, how long they spent on each section, what they answered for all of these questions. So it's a good way to kind of, you know, flip a lesson, so to speak. Um, if you want to still like record a lecture, you want your students to watch it, um, but maybe they do that on their own time, then when they come to class, it's more for the discussion and the active practice. Yes, and Canvas also has a new feature. If you haven't used, um, sorry, uh, Canvas Studio, yes, is um, similar to Edpuzzle. Um, I think another tool, um, Panopto, also does a similar thing if you've used that before, but Edpuzzle um, tends to be like the most simple version of this that um, a lot of teachers and professors like. Canva, if you haven't used that before, you can make infographics, presentations. It's like a free graphic design software. Um, and Canva actually just reduced, uh, um, introduced a video editing, very simplistic tool. So if you are new, completely new to video editing, but you have a lecture and you want to chop it up, or you have a presentation that you gave and you want to cut out things, um, Canva is free and it now offers um, video editing. So that's how we took kind of this lecture that was recorded via Zoom. Um, made it into more of an informational video, added graphics, and then on this page, uh, we turned it into kind of a critical conversation piece. So in the link, um, I, um, or I'm sorry, in the chat, I added the link to um, this page. So you, in that, uh, Audrey and I made with a very simple Google website. Um, and so that was another piece that we were able to do very, very simply. And if you haven't um, played with Google websites before, there's like, I, I do them pretty regularly now that Audrey's taught me the ins and outs. It's super, super easy. Um, so enjoy, enjoy that um, as well. So you have all the information um, for how we navigated providing access to um, providing opportunities for access um, between our teachers, our teacher leaders, and our faculty expert, Dr. McCarthy. And we're really excited and proud of the work that we've been able to do. Um, so I'll pause now for any um, connections, discussion, questions you may have. If this reminds me of you of some of the work you're doing, or you feel so inclined to share something similar, uh, please feel free to to uh, share. Dr. Christensen? I appreciate uh, Dr. McCarthy mentioned also in the chat that he added the he gave an infographic to the district leaders. I think as a struggling first year teacher 35 years ago, a lot the leadership has a lot to do with where they put you. And I had 35, 33 third graders out in a portable with no one near me. You know, I just think that that is so important for the leaders to understand you can set them up for failure or you can set them up for um, success. So I think that's a critical piece to follow through with on the leaders. Thank you. all Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, one other thing, it's just not done yet, but I was really hoping I could finish it before our meeting so I could show you all. But um, we have um, 
I'm going to call it a newsletter, but basically it's, um, yeah, kind of a newsletter, just summing up the work that our teacher leaders have done in the <clears throat> fall semester. And so um, we've provided all sorts of like analytics, like our teacher leaders been to your campuses this many times, and this is how many teachers we've been interacting with. And this is what those interactions look like. And we've also met with your assistant principal and your, you know, this and that. So it has those kinds of things in it. But we also included things like we've been working with Dr. McCarthy and this is the, you know, here's some things that, you know, we've learned from him and he's a faculty expert at the university, you know. Um, and then we, one other piece that we wrote is um, a little bit about how important the um, campus leadership is to a the success of an early career teacher and then asking them to like share with us like how can we help to support how can we support you in helping to support the early career teachers on your campus and so I very much appreciate that and I think that he, that piece is a huge um, a huge piece of the work that is so easy to like you know, forget or or to misstep and and not communicate. So we we're really working um, on all of these pieces. Dr. McCarthy's piece, our little newsletter, fall newsletter, <clears throat> the um, uh, the other piece that I showed you. Really working to like use these as tools for communication um, to help us to be better able to say like this is what the work looks like and this is you know, how it's helping the teachers on your campus. Well, before we hop off, um, I just wanted to um, share with you one more piece. And Weston, you might have to refresh, um, but I can talk through it um, if you don't see one more. One second. Um, our December meeting is, um, you know, we blink and these months fly by. So I just wanted to introduce, uh, thank you, Dr. McCarthy, for sharing sharing your work with us today. I'm super excited to have you um, with us. And for December, I hope you guys choose to um, join us again. Dr. Zolkowski will be um, joining us from the UT Tyler Department of, of um, Education. And she's here with us today. I invited her to come and um, check it out and um, be a part of the group. So thanks for um, coming. She's going to be talking about uh, resilience, teacher resilience and pre-service teacher resilience specifically. Um, and so I think we'll have a lot to learn from uh, Dr. Zolkowski. So thank you all very much for coming. Uh, reach out if you need anything. And uh, we appreciate your, your work around all, these, all this.